Today, we're going to take a look at the Gigabyte G1 Gaming Z170X Gaming 7. This is the Heroes of the Storm edition, so if you're obsessed with all things Blizzard, <laughs> this is the motherboard for you? I, I don't know. It's not really my thing. We're going to take a look. Okay, so Heroes of the Storm. You know, I, the box art on this is pretty cool. I, I, I gotta confess, I really was into StarCraft kind of a long time ago. Uh, I have not played Heroes of the Storm yet, uh, but I want to. And so I was kind of excited because I was like, ooh, did this come with Heroes of the Storm? No, it's just the box art and some other accessories and there's a, a flyer for a contest you can enter. So, aw. But, you know, overall, let's take a look at the motherboard. So the color scheme on this really pops. Now, the printed circuit board is actually sort of a matte black. I don't really know. It's definitely been coated with something, but it's just sort of a matte uh, black. And then the other thing that I notice is that the PCI Express slots, the 3x16 slots, are uh, metal clad. And I can see that the metal clad slots are actually soldered in and grounded. So this probably helps reduce EM interference. And if you've got a really heavy graphics card, this probably helps a lot with that. I can tell you that having gone to a LAN party or two in my time, that uh, some people that were handling their machines a little bit rough that had a really heavy graphics card, you know, they'll set their machine down on a table a little bit rough. The graphics card can actually rip out the slot or rip the plastic off of the PCI Express slot. So this is metal reinforced because it's grounded. It probably will help with some electromagnetic interference and that kind of thing. But mechanically, this sort of stainless steel finish or the stainless steel thing around the PCI slot, it's got to help with that mechanically. So that's a nice touch. The other thing that I noticed right off the bat is that we've got two M.2 slots. Now I checked the manual because this thing also has three SATA Express ports. And so depending on what combination of M.2 and SATA Express that you're using, if you're going to use both SATA Express, you know, you'll lose some SATA resources, even if you're using the M.2 PCI Express resources, because this chipset sort of blurs the line through the DMI of whether it's SATA or whether it's PCI Express, depending on what the resources are. But both of these M.2 slots do have a by four PCI Express connection. Now, both of them still go through the DMI interface that's available on the Skylake CPU, which means that you're limited to about four gigabytes per second through that interface. But overall, you've got a 32 gigabit interface with that DMI or four gigabytes per second, depending on how you count. In the box, it's really, it's no nonsense. There's not a lot of extra frills here. You've got the user manual, you've got the flyer for the Heroes of the Storm contest. You've got the Heroes of the Storm door knocker. You've got four SATA cables, uh, two right angle, two straight through. The motherboard IO backplate. This is the lighted IO backplate. You've got the, uh, the RGB LED in the backplate, so you can control that. Then you've got the G connector, which is what Gigabyte calls their little front panel connector thingy that takes your cases, front panel connections, and makes it a little easier to deal with. Your driver CDs, the SLI bridge. This motherboard does support two-way SLI or three-way crossfire, although that third card would be connected at by four through the DMI, so keep that in mind. And then you've got dust covers for your DisplayPort and HDMI connections on the back of the motherboard if you would like to, you know, if you're not gonna use the onboard Skylight graphics because, you know, who would, unless it's for extra monitors, you can put dust covers in those connections and keep dust from getting in them, so. Let's take a tour of the board really quick. At the top edge of the board, we've got the fan interface. This is a four pin PWM fans. This board is set up for PWM fans mainly. Um, so you'll need the four pin fans to make full use of it. There's also another four pin header here. This is actually a connection for the back plate. The back plate on this is padded and lighted and you can control it. It's an RGB LED. And so the, uh, the PCB interface around the audio is also lit up with RGB LEDs and you can control that through software. So if you want it to pulse on and off or, you know, follow the music or light up things or just be on continuously or be off continuously, you have that option on this board. So if you're blinging it out or you're doing case mods or you've got a, you know, a side window and you really want to show off your machine, you've got that option with this board in terms of lighting control and lighting effects, basically. Then we've got our eight pin 12 volt power connector for ATX. Then we've got two CPU fan headers. Uh, we've got the CPU opt and the CPU fan, that's the white one. CPU opt in the UEFI you can configure to be on all the time. So that would be suitable for say a water pump or something like that. Or you can use these two fan headers for like a push pull uh, configuration on a tower cooler. Then we've got our RAM slots. So the RAM slots only have the one locking mechanism, the one at the top to make it a little easier to install a graphics card. Although in terms of clearance between the PCI Express slots and the RAM, there's plenty of clearance. The, these RAM slots are not up against the graphics card at all. So even if you've got a graphics card with like a, a half inch back plate, I don't think it's gonna be much of an issue with this with this board because the very first slot on the board is a PCI Express by one lane. So you get a little bit more room. 
The first slot is also suitable for a triple slot setup. So if you've got a triple slot graphics card, I don't think you're going to have much of a problem with that either with the PCI Express layout on this board. The upper right corner of the, of the motherboard has a lot of interesting buttons. Uh, there's a power button, a reset button, and a clear CMOS button. You've got a diagnostic LED readout uh, to tell you what's going on with the board if it won't post or, or other information. Then you've got an echo button, which will... Uh, put it in economy mode like power economy so that you can save a little bit of power And then you've got an OC button which we'll play with a little bit later But the OC button basically is gigabytes approach to easy quasi automatic overclocking They've also got some overclocking software that works a little bit better than the OC button But the OC button will let you do an overclocking profile So then we've got the 24 pin ATX power connector You get two USB 3.0 front panel headers so that gives you a total of four USB 3.0 front panel headers, you've got another fan header, and then we've got three SATA Express connections. Each SATA Express connection can also optionally provide two six gigabit per second SATA ports. So we're talking about a total of eight because you've got the one other port that's not uh, SATA Express. Now, depending on how you're using this with your M.2, you may not be able to take advantage of all these SATA ports. There's a table in the manual that tells you which uh, SATA ports to use with whatever M.2 slot, depending on you know whatever your configuration is to maximize the number of ports that you get in either case. Now the M.2s also support SATA connections uh, as well as PCI Express. So depending on which you know if you're using a SATA M.2, uh, those are wired in for these side SATA as well. So if you're using SATA on the M.2, then the resources may not be available on the front of the motherboard, that kind of thing. So be sure to check out the table in the manual when you're setting up your machine so that you can sort of see that. Then below that, you've got this front panel connector. Now in the box this time around, there's actually a front panel connector uh, snap where you can actually snap the connectors in from your front panel case, like the, the front panel connections that come with your case, into this little plastic caddy. And then that whole thing can slide on this. The nice thing about this solution versus other solutions is that you don't lose anything in height. So if you were gonna run a, a three graphics card crossfire solution with this motherboard, uh, and you had a really long graphics card, if you had the really tall connector on the front panel connectors, the graphics card may interfere with that. This sort of obviates that. It's also a lot easier to hook your connectors into this little plastic thing and then plug that into the motherboard than to try to see on the motherboard you know which uh, which set of pins is the power connector which set of pins is the the reset button which set of pins is the speaker if you have a speaker uh the hard drive led a power led that kind of thing so you can just snap it in this thing and plug them all in at once which i think is is neat um some other approaches use uh you know pins that are wired in and just carry it out but i think i like this approach better then at the bottom edge next to this, we've got another fan connector. And then there's a mechanical switch. This is actually the dual BIOS switch. So uh, from the factory, this motherboard comes with a dual BIOS. And let me tell you that you really need to update the UEFI to the latest version. On Skylake, pretty much universally across all motherboards, uh, the launch UEFI with all these boards have a lot of bugs. And sometimes they're show-stopping bugs and sometimes they're not really serious. If you're an enthusiast and you want everything to be amazing, you really, really need to update your UEFI because your system can be weird and unstable for reasons you don't even understand until you update the UEFI. In Gigabyte's case, they actually give you two chips that store your UEFI. And so you can toggle between them with this switch. And so like if you're doing a, uh, an extreme overclocking and other general insanity, you can maybe load that on UEFI 1 and you know go to UEFI 2 when you're doing something a little bit more stable. They can be running completely different versions of the UEFI. So if you want to try out a beta version or there's, some, there's a version that you've modified for whatever reason, you can toggle between 1 and 2 and uh, recover from you know a bad flash or recover from whatever. So you know if you have a bad one, you can boot off of 1, flip it to 2, reflash to 2, and then, and then be in better shape with UEFI 2. So then you've got two, two more front panel USB 2.0 headers, a TPM header, an RS-232 COM port header in case anybody still has any RS-232 COM ports. I know I've still got some embedded electronics that use RS-232, so it's always nice to see RS-232. Then we've got an LED uh, demo header, and then we've got a, uh, a switch uh, for the front panel audio. So the front panel audio uh, on this board is sort of interesting. It's a creative sound core 3D. It's a quad core uh, creative sound solution. It's got the Nichicon uh, gold audio capacitors. It also has a user replaceable DAC and this switch has to do with gain. And so uh, by default, it's on 2.5 gain, but you can swap it to 6x gain. 
uh, for the front panel audio, depending on what kind of headphones you're going to run and what kind of gain you want. So if you get this and it's like, oh, I need more gain, you can toggle the switch and see what happens. That might be a fun thing for you to do. Let's take a look at the back connectors really quick because audio features factor into this motherboard a little heavier than I would have expected, but it's kind of neat. So we're going to take a look. All right, you've got your PS2 combination keyboard and mouse. If you're still rocking a Model M like me, well, there's your PS2 port. Then you've got these two USB ports that are special. These are USB 3 ports. Uh, they're wired for USB 3, but they have a separate power delivery system. So if you're using a USB DAC for your audio, you can use these two ports. You can also control the power situation for these ports from the UEFI. So you can turn them off, you can turn them on, whatever you want to do. Then you've got HDMI and DisplayPort for your integrated Skylake a graphic solution. Then you've got two USB 3.0 headers. Then you've got your USB 3.1 header and your first of two LANs. Now this motherboard has an Intel LAN and a killer NIC both. So if you're, depending on which way you swing, uh, you've got both the Intel NIC and the killer NIC. Then the red USB 3.1 port here is another USB 3.1 controller. And then above that, you've got USB 3.0. So overall, I would really recommend that you update the UEFI. Uh, the, the UEFI that shipped on this board was really sketchy. And that was probably because they sent it to us pretty early. But, I, I, you know, I've had this for three or four weeks. And uh, the UEFI, the last couple of versions of the UEFI are dramatically, dramatically way better. This is not anything bad. It's just that Skylake is a new platform and it took a little bit to get the UEFI right. In terms of overclockability and in terms of the features, the overclockability and other features in the UEFI have improved dramatically. So if you get one of these, be sure to update your UEFI right out the gate. Pretty much any Skylake motherboard from any vendor, you need to update the UEFI basically right away. Unless you get you know a later version that, that they'll have like a later shipping version. They'll probably fix that in the production lines. But if you happen to get a motherboard that's been sitting on a shelf and it's got an older UEFI, be sure to check that when you get a motherboard. So if you got one of these or you're thinking about getting one of these or if there's anything that I missed or did wrong or whatever, uh, be sure to let me know in the forums at techsyndicate.com. I'm Wendell. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.